Hello, greetings everyone. Um, very good morning to you. I hope you're all stay, staying safe. I'm Dr. Patricia Northover, a senior fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies, and I want to welcome you to our webinar being hosted by the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute and the Biotechnology Center at the University of the West Indies, Mona. I am the chair of the today's proceedings and also the chair of the Salises Research Cluster on Rural Development that is spearheading this speaker series. This is the fourth in our session. And today's speaker will be Dr. Sylvia Mitchell, a senior scientist who is from the Biotechnology Center at the University of the West Indies. And her topic will speak to how best to tailor biotechnology to serve our farmers and rural development in the region. I wish to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of a giant in the field of science and innovation at the University of the West Indies, Professor Emeritus Gerald Lelo, who was also responsible for the establishment of the Biotechnology Center. I wish to read a short extract in tribute to him and then take a moment, a minute silence. Professor Lelo is a giant in the scientific community, both at home and abroad. He is a fellow, he was a fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences, the Caribbean Academy of Science, and the Jamaica Society of Scientists and Technologists. He was a member of the American Chemical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the New York Academy of Science, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. He also served on the board of directors of the ICWI Group Foundation, the Gleaner Company, and was chairman of the Scientific Research Council Jamaica. Professor Lela received numerous honors for his work as a distinguished scientist and overall contributions to his country. These include the Order of Merit, the Order of Jamaica, and the Commander of the Order of Distinction. He also received the Institutes of Jamaica's Gold Musgrave Medal the Norman Manley Award for Excellence, the Philip Sherlock Award for Excellence, and the Centenary Medal, just to name a few. He gave his whole life and heart to science, as he believed it was at the center of human life and the key to improving all our lives, regardless of your socioeconomic background. The University family is grateful to have been a part of his extraordinary journey. We extend condolences to his family, friends, and colleagues in their time of bereavement. And I'd just like now to take um, a minute silence um, for this great man. Thank you very much. The moderator for today's talk is Dr. Audia Barnett, also a trailblazer in science, and most importantly, a leading consultant for sustainable agri-food systems. This year marks the UN Summit on Food Systems that seeks to drive, and seek to drive action to transform the way the world produces, consumes, and thinks about food. However, the summit has been mired in controversy with a debate centered on whose food system knowledge matters. This event that looks at the tailoring of science in food systems is thus very timely and important. 
Our Dr. Odia Barnett is a very able person to moderate today's discussion. And I'll just like to give you a brief background to introduce her. Dr. Barnett is the first female to have been promoted as representative in Canada for the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, ECA, a position she has held with distinction for eight years. She served as an advisor to the Director General of ECA on Caribbean affairs until her retirement. I don't know if she retired or retired. <laughs> Her international purview is complemented by experience in policymaking and management, having served at executive levels in government at the Secretariat for the National Commission on Science and Technology, the NCST, in the Office of the Prime Minister in Jamaica, and the Scientific Research Council, the SRC in Jamaica. She also has significant experience in private sector and, and the academy, where her focus has been on food safety, food science, yeah. and technology. Other career highlights include being Jamaica's focal point for the Intergovernmental Committee for the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, which is where we met. Um, Dr. Barnett, <laughs> when we had that um, National Committee on Biosafety that I served on with you as chair and um, Elaine. And she has been the vice president of the Jamaica Society of Scientists and Technologies, Technologists, as well as a professional member of the Institute of Food Technologists in the U United States. Audio is a proud graduate of the Wilmers Girls High School, the University of the West Indies twice over, and the University of Alberta in Canada. She holds a BSc in chemistry and biochemistry, an MSc in food science, and her interest in biotechnology and its influence in life and the natural sciences directed further studies which culminated in a PhD in chemistry. Dr. Barnett has authored several publications in peer-reviewed journals and in the popular press. She is a recipient of awards and fellowships such as the Pelican Award from the University of the West Indies, and she's a fellow in the America's 2000 project at Rice University in the United States. Young at heart, Audia takes joy in demonstrating the use of innovation for the empowerment of women and youth for a food secure future. I know quite pleased and proud to hand over the reins to Dr. Barnett. And I know that you will have a very wonderful engagement um, in today's session. So over to you, Dr. Barnett. Thank you so very much, um, Patricia. And again, I would also like to pay my own personal tribute to Professor Layla. He was one of those stalwarts that you could always count on to have in your corner once this science based. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And it is my privilege and pleasure to be with you this morning. I, I want to congratulate you and your team for the awesome job that you have been doing in putting together relevant topics for, for us to digest a, bit, a little bit more and to give us new insights. Biotechnology, as you know, has been used for centuries in our agri-food systems. Also in medical and healthcare products and services, as well as in the preservation and management of our environmental assets. Our own scientists over the years have sought to distinguish between biotechnology and the term modern biotechnology. And scientists all over the world have been struggling with trying to communicate to the average man in the street or woman in the street, the difference. Because when you hear the term biotechnology, immediately um, what comes to many persons' mind is genetic engineering or genetic modification. But we want to point out that biotechnology has been around for many, many years and been using all you know, all sorts of useful products and services. 
We know though, as demonstrated by the current um, wave of information and misinformation relating to the COVID-19 pandemic, that it is becoming increasingly difficult for some of us to distinguish between the two. What is fact, what is fake? And sometimes to our own detriment. So again, I commend Dr. Northover and Salisa's team, as well as the Biotechnology Center for facilitating this discord, discourse in an area that may very well be essential to our food security and the ability to thrive as African descendants. The webinar, as you've heard, will focus on tailoring biotechnology to better serve Afro-descendant farmers and rural development in the Caribbean. Dr. Cynthia Mitchell, whom I have known for over 20 years, I think it's probably closer to 25, Sylvia, okay. will be sharing her thoughts and recommendations drawn from her known cash knowledge and experience in the area of local biodiversity. Sylvia is co-investigator on the Seed Infrastructures Research Team and senior lecturer. She actually spent some time at the Scientific Research Council, as well as CERI, the Sugar Industry Research Institute. And something that I didn't know about Sylvia, although I know her about so many years, was that she was actually born in Ghana. So she was born in Ghana, and, and, and so we come back to the whole issue of um, Africa and, and, and the role in terms of all biodiversity. Sylvia has devoted her almost her entire working life to looking at plants, medicinal plants in particular, and their role in bioactive research, health, nutraceuticals, product development, and you name it. In 2019, Dr. Mitchell was named as one of 70 plus university women of distinction, recognized for outstanding achievements in her field. Sylvia is consistent and she's persistent. <laughs> <laughs> she has really devoted all these years based on her, uh, her firm background in botany and in geography. This is where she did her, her bachelor's degree. She then went on to do her PhD in biotechnology at the University of West Indies. And I think Sylvia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you are one of the first that is of the biotechnology center. And Professor Lee, as we heard, was very instrumental in, in getting that, that center established. Mm -hmm. So we have with us a trailblazer. Once you want to know anything about some of our um, medicinal plants, such as sarsaparilla, chain root, um, turmeric, et cetera, all, all roads lead to Sylvia. And so <laughs> it's, it's a great pleasure that I welcome you, Sylvia. You have published in the public, in the popular press as, a, as well as in peer reviewed journals, and you have distinguished yourself, yourself as a woman, as a female scientist, but very importantly, as a Caribbean um, person of, 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 of work. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask um, that you, that, that you, you, before I, I, I actually get Sylvia on, online, I'd like to ask that we all mute our phones or Zoom recording when we are not speaking. Mute your mics, turn off your phones. Uh, make sure that if you have a question, because Sylvia is going to give us a rich presentation <laughs> and you're going to have questions or comments and you may want to challenge her um, on some of the issues. <laughs> but use the Q&A, the Q&A box, maybe at the top of your screen or the bottom to note this. Um, if we don't have enough time to answer all your questions, 
I am sure we'll be able to facilitate it through direct email after. But try and put your questions down as you as you proceed through the presentation. Sylvia will speak for about 40 minutes. And um, I want to remind you that the session is being recorded. So again, if you put your questions in the Q&A, we can have them to respond to if, if we don't get to each of them. So it's showtime. I want to welcome Dr. Sylvia Mitchell, who will give us a presentation on tailoring biotechnology to better serve Afro-descendant farmers and rural development in the Caribbean. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you very much. And yes, Professor Leila, Professor Ahmad, without them, there would be no biotechnology center and I would not be here. Professor Ahmad took a chance on me and gave me an empty room to do my research in. And as they say, the rest is history. So this is where we are now. And I am very pleased to be part of what Salicit is doing through SRAD to really get, get us all together in terms of what we're going to do in the rural areas. So I guess you're hearing me, everything's all right, everybody's good. So let me go ahead. I'm going to be giving some concepts and challenging as, as you heard from, from Dr. Barnett. This is not something one person can do, but I want to present from the biotechnology side. And the term tailoring has been chosen very carefully. The reason for tailoring, think about it, you're a tailor and you get a customer and the customer says to you, oh, here's a piece of cloth, I want you to make me something. And you could lose and waste a lot of time and money and cloth because you're not sure what the customer wants. But if the customer is able to tell you, oh, I need a dress jacket and I need it three quarter sleeve and I want three buttons at the top and I don't want any tail. The more accurate the person can tell you what they want, is the easier your tailoring is going to be and the less money and time and energy you're going to, to, to wait to give them what they want. So there are a lot of tools in biotechnology, the same way that a tailor has his scissors and his sewing machine and so on, biotechnology has tools, but what are we going to use those tools for? And how are we going to decide what it is we want so that we can serve our farmers and rural development in the Caribbean. So the first thing to do is to foresight. And that is to look at what you want, that suit that you want to give to the tailor. So we have to think about how we want the future to be for our Caribbean farmers. And then yes, as, as Doc said, modern biotechnology. And then we're going to see out of that, how we're going to tailor biotechnology. What a little glimpse of some of the things we have been doing, and then we're going to wrap it up to give some ideas of the future, for the future. And we're going to do this in foresighting, thinking about pros and cons of the different ways that we can develop agriculture. So in the Caribbean, we're small, so extensive agriculture more than intensive. Again, because of the smallness and uh, work that has been done, like with hurricanes, have shown that if you have a polyculture, it is more resilient than having a monoculture. We are a place rich in folk medicine. And what does that mean for our biotechnology versus developing a pharmaceutical drug industry? So these are the kind of things we're going to look at so that we can start thinking about foresighting a future that we want. Because if you want to get somewhere, you have to know where you want to go and how to get there. Then they'll never give up. Yeah, the persistence that Doc was talking about, because this is what I did when I started the research group in 1999. It's a long time, that's 
22 years ago. So I, I, I've, I've looked at it and I've seen where agriculture has been kind of divided into these two areas. One where money is valued above ecology. So you have the capitalist society where it doesn't matter to them if the soil is dead. It doesn't matter to them that they have one plant in there and all the other plants are not there and they're covering it with pesticides and so on, as long as they get that yield, right? So the yield is pushed above the ecology. Um, we have seen in Jamaica where houses for people, Bernard Lodge, is being pushed above ecology, above biodiversity, even above farming. And the other one that I've seen is where industrial development is pushed above the problems with global warming. Or you can look at ecology being valued more than profits and agricultural land being protected. Um, this is a beautiful picture of the Caribbean uh, biodiversity, which we don't want to, to be spoiled because we can also use it for tourism and if you think about what would be valued here above profit, I would say it would be sustainability. So yes, push as much profit as you can, but not to the detriment that in 10, 15 years, we don't have it. And then that last point is we really want the folk, our normal people to benefit from our traditional knowledge and not for the money to go to the totally to the pharmaceutical companies. So those are some ideas for the future. I have been trying to find a, a, a kind of pictogram of, of what this would look like. They have started to do what is called life cycle analysis, but I haven't seen any for the, the um, tropics. If you notice here, this is a, a monoculture, but this is the type of, of foresighting that is needed, where you take into account what you're going to do with the biomass, the fuel, the, 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 um, the residues, how do you recycle? And I'm hoping that at least out of this, we will be challenged to, to foresight the future we want for ourselves because we do not have the space, people, money, or time to be unfocused in the rollout of biotechnology research and solutions. And what I have seen even at the university is everybody just doing their own thing and there is no focus towards an end game. And I do believe we have to tailor our effort to where we want to go. I've seen a, a couple of where this is happening. So um, China, you can say they foresighted how they want their future. They put their people into um, units and then they have the greenery all around in between. Um, Singapore, you would think that they would not have greenery with the amount of people there. But I, even in Jamaica, they, there's two buildings that have this kind of concept. One is the Faculty of Medical Science, which the Chinese built. And in there, nearly every room has the light coming in from outside and it's not hot. And a few areas are air conditioned. So this is a kind of, of ideas that um, I want you to think about. And to the Caribbean then, two different futures and both of them, um, you would say, okay, why not either of them? So one is Cuba and one is the United States at the top. Uh, and there's a lot of figures you can get for this. This animal protein is the dark green, light green plant protein, fat, carbohydrates. So you can do a lot of comparisons. Cuba was kind of pushed into organic and backyard farming because they couldn't get access to fertilizer. They also couldn't get access to drugs. So they incorporated their traditional knowledge into their medical system, as opposed to the US. And the result, um, so if you summarize Cuba, free medical care, traditional knowledge, preventative over curative, local food clinics in the community are what I call new knowledge, and I'll explain that, as opposed to how the US do it. You can see here that the Cubans have been able to have a lot of physicians around their people, low illiteracy rates, low infant 
uh, mortality compared to Latin America. And I must say that um, biotech, Cuba has taken on biotech more than any other country in the Caribbean as a policy. And if you see here, the per capita care, this is the cost. This is Cuba, very little cost and still high life expectancy as compared to the US. So if we decide to go this way, um, I've heard arguments that this way is, it, you know, it won't work and it's not productive and it, it can't bring a future. Well, here's the evidence that yes, it can indeed give a very good future. So when we get this new knowledge, this is a new knowledge now, we'll learn that vitamin A is in these plants, vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, and so on. Do we then uh, go to pills and live off vitamin C pills, vitamin E pills, or do we incorporate these vegetables and plants and herbs and spices and medicinal plants into our diet? Right? Do we go this route, which is to me is more the Caribbean, or do we go this route where they're even going to the stage of making meat in a petri dish? And I would dare say that, I hope that you'll agree with me that this side is, is a, the better one. And well, so we have a plant called uh, Moringa and it's shown to do a lot of different things. We can put it into our, our dinners and our vegetable. And um, if we want to, to dry it, we can, but we don't need to go down to the phytochemicals to get the effect of these plants. So there we go. Can't we make ganja tea? What is wrong with ganja tea for, for this or that or the other? Or fever grass tea for COVID. What is the problem with these things that it's only when it, it, it goes through all this processing and so on and so on that it's considered um, okay to use. We do this in the background of us being a hotspot. We have a high level of endemic plants in a very small landmass of the earth. So we're up in the, I think the fifth highest of islands in, of Jamaica is, and the Caribbean is one of the top hot spots. And we have publications to show this. But we also, if you, if you notice, we have black areas within that hot spot. So what we have is hot spots within the hot spots. So we have plants that are only in the cockpit country. And therefore, our biotechnology has to be tailored. So as well as knowing where we want to go, it also has to be tailored to to our strengths that we have. And you can consider them weaknesses too, because if we don't take care of what we have, if we plant cement and, and, and houses in these areas, then we might be uh, getting rid of a plant that is found nowhere else. So we have to, to keep this into our mind at all times. And one of our problems is when we get down to it, we don't we have a flora that has no pictures and some of these plants we don't even know what they are so i will come back to the root tonics what i want to spend <laughs> a few minutes on is what we're calling modern biotechnology now i can't cover the whole field i'm just going to point out a few things that i want you to think about as you read through the literature first of all what is agriculture so agri basically is a person who grows things, science, art, and business of growing, and then you can co cut it up into different types of culture. So tissue culture is also culturing. Um, biotechnology gets its strength from the sciences and engineering. And because it is a technology and not bioscience, those tools and techniques then can then be used to produce products that can be sold. Okay, so it, it, it's, it's a kind of um, out of its own, is a, has a multidisciplinary characteristic. And if you think of what actually is biotechnology, it's actually any technological application that uses a living organism or a derivative thereof. So 
as Doc said, it's, it's a very wide and it comes down to a large degree to the genes. So I'm going to give you a very quick biotech lesson. So we have the code of life, which is in every living organism, which is your CGAT, there are four nucleotides. And I'm going to give you another little um, parable. So inside your nucleus, consider it as your library. And inside the cytoplasm is, is your kitchen. All right, so I wanna make a cake. I go to the library and I look in the recipe book and nobody's allowed to take the recipe book out. So that's your DNA. But I transcribe the recipe and I take it to my kitchen and that is your, your mRNA, okay? So we've been hearing about mRNA. And then in the kitchen, I'm gonna turn that mRNA into my protein. So I'm going to take the eggs and the flour and all the different things and I'm going to mix it up and I end up with my cake or in this case I end up with my protein okay so you have an idea of where what the genes are so a gene is a stretch of that DNA that is going to end up to make a protein plant breeding I want to I, I really looked for this picture because it, it shows you that this was happening long before anything was called biotech. So bustle sprout, cabbage, kale, all of these are varieties of one species that was bred and they, they are now considered different species, okay? And then we had something called hybrid breeding. So what you do there, you'd get a pure line and then you'd cross it. But if you save the seed from this cross line, you would get a whole heap of variation. So what, what happened there around the 1930s that you started getting seed companies. So the farmer was no longer saving his seed if he wanted to get this higher yield. And we have to really think about do we want to take on this hybrid breeding? And if we are going to save our seeds, what does that mean? For corn, if you notice, this is up open populate, pollinated, so you don't do anything. And then they started doing these hybrid breeding. And if you notice, this is a biotech GMO. Yes, there was a, a, a greater increase in yield, but it's on top of all of this yield increase right here. So when we're thinking about what we want for the future, we have to think not only of GMO, but also about breeding, hybrid breeding. Do we want it? Because that means we're going to need seed companies and do those seed companies have our interest in heart and do we have priority for those seeds and are those seeds suited for our environment? You notice I'm giving you more questions than answers, but that's okay. So GMO, I have three problems with GMO and we have to look at them to see if this is really the way we want to go. The first one is this marker gene. The first one was this antibiotic resistance. So whenever the gene got put into a new plant, the marker gene did as well. So the plant was resistant to antibiotic continually and people didn't like that. So work that was done in Jamaica that had this antibiotic um, marker gene, those were, as far as I know, discarded and a new generation of work would have to be done. So that's the next problem I had, that it takes a lot of time. It takes a big um, research group. And if anybody knows about the Biotechnology Center, we started with one academic in 1989. In 1999, um, we had two, and I think in the last 10 years or so, we've had three, but one has been borrowed. So we've only actually ever had two academics at the Biotech Center and, and about three that have been borrowed from other departments to end up with about 25 research students at any one time. So with that kind of restriction, how, what is the best, how do we tailor it towards where we want to go? And we have to think about this 
the other problem I have with the, um, we came with when we were trying to do NCSC and the bias safety is that when you put out these crops before you allow them out into use, you have to restrict. And there is a distance of miles so that you don't have pollen getting into your, your other crops before you, you give an okay that yes, this plant can go out. And the distance was wider than, than, the, than Jamaica. And the biosafety um, group I was with didn't meet again after that was <laughs> that came out. It, it, it stopped meeting. So I don't know where it is now. I don't know if that issue has been sorted out, um, but I have seen even, I've been to meetings where even Monsanto is turning from this GMO. Uh, they are two other ones that they're looking at. One is marker assisted breeding. And this one does not have the paperwork of GMO because you are not actually inserting a gene you're doing the yield, the breeding as it was before, but what you're doing, instead of waiting to get the yield based on how the plants look, you're looking at it according to the genome pattern for the genes of interest. So you can actually go faster and you can identify useful genes in your mixes without using the transgenic method. And because it's not genetic modification, the resulting variety is not transgenic. So you don't have all the paperwork that comes with the GMOs. The last one that we're working on is gene editing. This one is a little better than the GMO, um, but it is still very, very new. So the pros and cons are still being worked out. But the idea is that you can splice out a part of the DNA a lot more accurately. GMO, you're putting a gene in, you don't really know where you're putting it in. And with the GMO, they were trying to get out the marker gene. So each, each condition or each technology is actually like GMO, it's, it's a, quite a few of them. So you'd have to look at each of them and see how useful they can be. So this, this one is still, I can't say yes or no about this one because it's still under active um, development. I want to give you a glance at, um, and this is another thing for foresighting, and I'm not going to try to do the foresighting myself. I am encouraging us as a group to do the foresighting and to the end that it is not that we expect the whole of Jamaica to say, yes, this is the direction we want to go. What we want to do is to get a critical mass of like-minded people that can say, yes, this is the suit I want. We think that is best to wear, and then we can tailor the biotechnology to fit it. Just give you an idea of Taiwan, what they do. 40% of their biotechnology is plant tissue culture. And then they have aquaculture, biotechnology, 24%, biopesticide, biofertilizer, 8%. So it doesn't always have to be, um, no, this is agriculture, biotechnology. And then you see that as a bit between all of this. So there's a lot of different technologies to consider. I'm not going to do it here. I'm encouraging all of us to go out and look and see what is available and see which ones we as a country is best to, to keep pushing. For myself and the work that I've been doing, um, coming from botany geography, the part of the process that I see as needing the most help is to get clean planting material. The number one there, we cannot, leave out and we cannot keep building this this beautiful building and our foundation is weak we have a floor that has no pictures scientific names common names no pictures a little morphology that is kind of out of date and not detailed enough so we have to continue to work on our floor until it is properly identifiable, even by a picture. But we also need morphology and, and other studies. DNA barcoding, plant tissue culture. And I will go through each of these quickly. 
DNA barcoding, I think this is, uh, is very useful, but not alone. This has to be also matched by the pictures and the morphology to match it with the, the, the DNA of the plant. But because we are coming, we are uh, biodiversity rich, we have to be thinking about this. We can also use it to look at the relationship with pests. Okay. And this one was done in um, looking at a mixture of whatever it is in the soil or soil breakdown, and you can see what plants made it up. So history. Tissue culture has a lot of advantages. And, and hopefully quite a few of you know the advantages. I'm not going to read them out. It has to, the methods, again, there are different methods and you have to avoid the ones that will increase genetic variability, but there are methods that you use that decrease genetic variability and you also get it free from contamination. So the method is initiation. You go it in the growth room. It's an idea of the plants that we have put in culture and then hardening and you water it in, this is actually a sarsaparilla. And we have got sarsaparilla back into the wild from what the work we have done. These are four of my kids that are now well grown and we are still trying to establish, these are different hardening. Um, so this is aloe, this is neem, that you can also develop your medicinal products from. And then I want to run through some for pineapple. So you put the, the plant that you want into tissue culture, the, the tip, the bud, and then you multiply it, root it. And this was from zero 07. We were taking it out and working out the best way to get to farmers. This was in St. Catherine. Um, they worked out how to harden them and to grow them in the field. So this was a farmer that did the best with, because I gave them to it and I just told them to experiment and gave them some guidelines because it's better that way than you give them the technology and it's already developed. Let them be part of the process. And you can see the pine, no, no difference with genome, but this is just going through the tissue culture process. And that was reaping time. The plants, the flowers were beautiful as they came out and everybody was, was excited. That is an idea of the fruit. And they got, they're excited too that they got um, side shoots, suckers that they could plant again. And the, the interesting story here is they learned to take data. And you notice this young man here, this was his father's farm and he's here again. So I brought some more and they had the suckers. So we were going to compare the two. And I saw them and I said to him, this looks too small to plant in the soil. And his answer was, no miss, them small, but them come up fast. So here it is a technology totally transferred to the farmers. And they were able to take data so the height of the plant went up, the diameter went up, the number of leaves stayed at the same, and then you can see how the fruit came in. And this is, is a, a big desire of mine because the people that I've found to help me, okay, the grad students are concentrated on their work. The, the, the projects, you can't do anything without project money. So the people I've found that can help me to take data and to, to, to do all the things that I've done is actually the farmers. And this is where we want to go. We want to get pineapple in large numbers. This is from St. Vincent. I want to see this in Jamaica. Okay. The next story is about root tonics. I was given a set of bottles from forestry department, found sarsaparilla in it, and cheney root is the largest number, was in the tonics. They sell above 100 because some of it was a root and some was a leaf. 94 plants in all. So we started putting the cheney root into culture and carry it out all the way. And the sarsaparilla, oh, this is a sarsaparilla. And this is a cheney root, we found two types from the farm and we put it into tissue culture. But as I said, up to now, 
we still have some plants that are not identified. And the problem with this here is if we don't tell the people what we want to do or to get to where we want to go, then we don't get the funds because the funds are going to the, these fancy things. Or if I want to say I want to do um, this, this gene editing, maybe I get the money faster than if I say I want to traipse up and down looking for blood wisp. So we have to be very determined of what we want to do and how we want to do it. The other part about biotech, and that's about tropical soils. And these are two areas. This will take a, a lecture on its own, so I'm not going to try. But one is biochar. And actually, I just read a report that Sweden is taking all its old Christmas trees and garbage and turning it into biochar, which it is using for energy and for its soils. And then we have the soil inoculants. So these are the two I think have the greatest potential for our tropical soils. And see some results here, not my own. Again, this is where we need to get funding to do these kind of soil and farm experiments. And I want the farmers on, to come on board to, to help us to do this. And the last one is in, in the lab is biofarming where we put these plants into tissue culture, we got somatic embryos, and we were able to show that this anti-cancer chemical DTS in guinea hen weed was at a much higher concentration than the wild plant, and therefore this can be another industry. So I know that my time is going, so I'm going to quickly finish up. For citing what the Caribbean agriculture for sustainable rural development would look like from my viewpoint. Again, this is something we have to look together. Have I left out anything? Have I put in something that I shouldn't put in? So I say there's still a need for high tech. There's, there's need for, um, for example, we have genetic services even now. There is education that we need to do. Two, elite planting material. We need to get going on identifying our plants, having these proper morphology and pictures of our floor. And we need plant tissue culture for multiplication and for storage and these seed and gene banks. Our farming needs technology assisted. And I'm looking from it as a geography aspect in, in a system approach rather than a biotech approach, because the biotech approach has to fit in within the whole system that we, we are looking for in the future. We need to model these complex systems because as we said, the polyculture is, is better than the monoculture. And we can argue that point, but I think the literature is very clear on that. We need to do field trials with these biosoils. As, as I did there but before, we can fingerprint the pests. We need to do yield analysis and post-harvest studies for our traditional knowledge into products that are, can bring back the wealth into the, the rural areas. So I'm looking at four, which you think, you know, how does that fit? But it's the relationships, even this one, CIRAD is that first A. And then we need these farmer to farmer, farmer to researcher, researcher to business. And I just want to remind you what the Jamaica Biotechnology Policy said. Promotion of agricultural research. Priority will be given to agrobiotech research, particularly to increase agri-productivity and food security on the island. So we can't leave out the microbial biotechnology. That's a lecture by itself, won't go there. We want to use our DNA fingerprinting for different purposes, as you see here, and for protection of our varieties. That is a whole discussion that we need to have. Do we need plant varieties? How is the best way? Do we want to go the route of varieties at all? What the farmers will do is they will keep their seed and they will you know, get their seeds kind of where the, the harvest is predictable, and then they may trade their seed. If you think about it, it's, the, it's how the hybrid breeding is doing, but on a, on a more um, big stop scale so that you, you can still get the benefits. 
of the, um, the plant being resistant, but also get yield increases. We can go simple. Th these are things that I've tailored biotechnology to do during COVID and I've been able, or complex, I've been able to get it into schools. We've been able to do tissue culture with liquid fertilizer, rainwater, and ambient conditions. We've gone into schools, we went into Campion, we went into St. Hughes, and they were able to do tissue culture. And to businesses, Christiana potato growers, we went to them. So there is the, the advantage of, of the interaction now between the researchers and the farmers is that there, there is, <laughs> the research is validating what the farmers know. It's helping to conserve what they have. It's providing clean planting material, engineering in, innovative machines, while the farmers are identifying that biodiversity that needs to be conserved, conserved in situ and helping with data collection. So this is actual examples that have been happening with me, like I said, I've been working with the farmers, I've been working quietly, but this is what has been happening. So we are providing micropropagated. That, that farmer that you saw there with pineapple, he has his own farm of pineapple now, right? He took his, it and he kept multiplying it and multiplying it. Um, those pineapples are in, in Flagstaff, they're, they're all over the place, these, these um, micropropagated plants. The, we provided information on what plants are medicinal in Jamaica, established herbal gardens, and also gone to the farmers to explain the Nagoya protocol and a need to protect their intellectual property. While the farmers have shared their knowledge, shared information about their use, helped with data taking and with pictures and, and so on and so on. So there, there's a lot that they have done for the future I can see where CIRAD and SOAD can help us to, to make this future come quicker. Um, through CIRAD with Just Foods, I was put in contact with a researcher in Barbados, we have stuff to do. They're in contact with a researcher in St. Augustine, we have a vegetable and fruit, sorry, not seminar, questionnaire that I need to talk to CIRAD about how to get out to the farmers of Jamaica, and then we help them with the analysis. And of course, the farmers, there's a lot that they are collaborating with us and kind of collaborate with us on. What we want, this is a problem, but this is also a solution. We need to tell all these people where we want to go so that all of these funds that are available do not be sent all over the place and where we really want to go, we don't end up going. So that's me, thank you, do be in touch. That's my email. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Dr. Mitchell. Okay, thank you. Oh, if everyone is like me, they would be dizzy now with information. <laughs> I mean, you covered, you covered so much. And uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, there may be more questions and answers but it at least gives us a lot of food for thought. And I myself have a page full of questions. However, I want to yield to our audience and I hope that um, everyone has been online tuned in and I see we have a few questions. And um, I'll take about two or three, Sylvia, if you don't mind, and then you'll yeah. respond and then, um, and they will go the next round. Some persons are a little bit shy to start with their questions at first. So this is coming from Jeannie Bernard. And she says, I see how biotech can help rural development, but how might it specifically help rural farmers since it seems that you would need specialty skills to engage in this field? How will it help the average farmer? And I think yeah. Silver, you showed that. Yes. Must say, I do like the out of the box thinking. So that's one. Another question, and, and, and then I think you dealt with that, but you can just reinforce. Another question from the same person. Not sure how integrated agriculture is in the primary and secondary education system in Jamaica. But if it's yeah. not, 
I assume that moving toward biotech would mean taking agriculture seriously at the early levels of education. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for these questions. And the final question here is, love that you mentioned the questionnaire, leaning toward active participation by the locals in their development. So I'm going to ask you, Sylvia, if you could take those three questions and then we do another round. Yes. Okay, so I have always ever dealt with the average farmer. I, I don't deal very well with the sophisticated farmer. It is the, the average farmer that, that I have been working with. And yes, we do tend to go in with a questionnaire and we do ask the, the farmers to help us and they gather the information. And the questionnaire that we, we do go in and ask is, um, how do you use your biodiversity? So there's the, the two that I gave there are new ones in terms of the vegetable and the fruit. But if there's any, any area that is interested in this, um, there are two questionnaires we do. One is called the Tramil questionnaire, traditional medicine of the island. And in that you go and ask the households again, not the professionals, the households, how do you use your plants? If you have a cold, what do you do? If you have uh, um, sugar, what do you do? And we have collected a lot of that information. So that will help the world farmers because the world farmers now will have a better idea of what is possible in their area because usually those are the, they use the plants that they grow or that they gather. Um, there's a lot of information to give to rural farmers in terms of what will grow well. I do not tend to do like soil tests. What I do is go in with all of these different plants, like little, little plants of each, each type and plant it and see how they, they take and um, see what, where the farmers are. So when we went in with the pineapple and we went in um, Glengoff with these little pineapple in, in the jars, and we had, you know, we, we cleaned it off and, and put it into soil right in front of them. And I told them that within a year they would get pineapple. They laughed, they laughed at me. And I said, okay, let's do it. So the farmers do not need any speciality skill. They are good at farming. They are better than me at farming. So I give it to them and say, okay, this is what you need to do. It just needs to be under humidity for two two weeks and then you slowly decrease the humidity and they came up with all kind of innovations on their own i didn't show all of them i can't show all of them so it's just a conversation back and forth um asking the the rural area what they need how they need it and so on so that, that is that that is the first one and the second one what what i've been able to do because i can't go into all the primary and secondary schools i'm one person but what what we have been doing is teaching the teachers of science in the the shortwood teachers college and they come every year to the biotechnology center and do tissue culture and this last year because we're in covid we did it online and we did an even in more intensive and afterwards they said oh my gosh i can do this in the schools so it is something that can be done in the schools. And what is nice about doing tissue culture in the schools is you have the chemistry and the biology in there. And about the questionnaire, we will be in touch because after this, this was taking up my time. I am going to get this questionnaire out and it's already been given out in Trinidad. And I think in, in one other island in the Caribbean, um, the vegetable one is basically asking what vegetables you have and the fruit is what fruits people have in them yard. So as many people with yard and, and we see what they have in their yard. And we go from there. The more we've learned, it's a, it's a better we can tailor what we're doing, right? Right, Doc? <laughs> excellent, excellent. And I must congratulate you, Silva, because you have really demonstrated that you have been working with the, the average farmer, the, the, the farmer, as you said, who knows agriculture inside out and is able to use innovation based on the technologies that you have. I love the idea that you're also in schools and, the, and training the trainer is excellent. And one of the, the offshoots of COVID is showing us that we can reach 
have indeterminate number of people. persons via technology. So okay. we have short food, but now you can go to all the training um, colleges, teachers' colleges, and infuse the information, and then also engage with um, the ministry with curriculum development, et cetera. So I want to congratulate you. That is, that is excellent. And um, GD, I see you have you are satisfied with the with the mm -hmm. with the responses. So we have quite a number of persons online. Welcome, and I'm happy that you stayed with us this long. We are really really thrilled to have you, and I'm sure you're happy that you you devoted the time to listen to Dr. Mitchell. So we have a few more questions. The second round here is from Craig Craig Peru, and he asked. Has much of this knowledge been part of the production of the national export strategy developed by JAMPRO? And I want to just add to that the Vision 2030. This has been included in the Vision 2030. Um, okay. We also ask, let me just finish the other one. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, exactly it's the same one. He he exactly. Said, that's why. Bad tech represented. Okay. So he, he read my mind. Okay. So over to you, Sylvia. <laughs> yes. So um, I don't know if it, the people at the university realize it, but I've been to nearly all of these, <laughs> these meetings. Um, and I'm usually sometimes the only university person there, but I still think that that there, there is a new crop of young people that are doing these national export strategy and are doing the, the, um, this PIOJ led vision industry panel that do not yet realize that this should be part of it. And I, I thank Sirad for the opportunity to get this information out. The one problem about being in a place where you are virtually the only academic, and I, I should say um, in tissue culture, the only one academic at the biotechnology center, it is, it is very hard to be everywhere. Um, I will quickly answer that next question with the College of Agriculture, Science and Technology. And the collaboration there is that Dr. Webster was my, was my student and he did his work with tissue culture. He was the one who did that work with the Guinea hen weed and with Aki and he did somatic embryogenesis. So he is now leading whatever they're doing at the College of Agriculture Science and Education. The, the science officer in the Ministry of Science and Technology is also my PhD student, Dr. Chenille Delahaye. So the, everybody who comes to the Biotechnology Center gets positions. And if we ever came together, Riley, Dr. Riley is also from the Biotechnology Center. You know, so um, there, there can be more, but the best thing we can do is to, to provide that vision or the foresighting of the future while they do their, their, their PhD work so that they can continue to be part of that process. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. And just to, to underscore the, um, the Vision 2030 process has been a very intensive one. Uh, and it has taken place over several years. So I um, am pretty sure that the whole area of agrobiotechnology is included. I think uh, Professor McLaughlin was policy. more. I think Professor McLaughlin yes, yes, did. Uh, yes. But this tailoring, yes. tailoring, which is, is less the modern biotechnology and more ground root technology, I don't think is. is it, I mean, it, I think it needs more of it. Um, right. For, if, for if sure. You think and about, I, I want to again comment. Sorry, let me just say something. For the fact that biotechnology is said to be um, a priority, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not how we should treat priorities. You know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, and, and, you know, this is always a cry of scientists, <laughs> you know, yes. we, we have these areas and sometimes we don't um, master the art of communicating the, the importance of our, our relevant disciplines. And I think the work that you have done, making some inroads in, in, in that area. I want to, I want to segue into a, a question that I have, um, and maybe you could just sort of vision it. Uh, foresighted in terms of how we can use biotechnology as a tool to help our small farmers that are reeling from cradle lasting. Yes, yes. It it is a it is a big problem. For example, yes. we have we have um livestock we have goats we have cows we have yeah, you know yeah, animals yeah. that a truck will just come and, and move do you see biotechnology playing a role because this is how we can show our relevance to, to the various ministries whether it's commerce whether it's security whether it's, it, it's science whether it's education and that's how we get our voices to be heard there's a there's there there, there have been in other jurisdictions, they have been work using um, coding, and you spoke to, yeah. to genetic coding, coding, but implanting a chip right in, in animals so that you are able to track wherever those animals go. But do you, do you see us getting to that kind of stage in terms of our small ruminants, for example? I, I'm I'm wondering if we need to do something more technological rather than biotechnological. Um, there there needs to be some some early warning system. Um, I know we're not allowed to use electric fences, but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's not a warning. That is um. <laughs> The, the, the low tech one I can think of, and it has been done in the past, is you put a, 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 a good a good thickness, a good like two feet, I don't know how, how wide you'd have to do it, of really prickly, prickly plants, right? And, and then you protect you know, you 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 have less entrances to to worry about, and then you guard those entrances with some really nice vicious dogs. Um, there was a friend of Craig mine. Just said, I like this. <laughs> there, there was a friend of mine that um, yes, and then and then you use the live fences because some like tuna, you can pick tuna, but you 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 you. That is that is the level I'm thinking at. You know, I'm I'm I leave the chip and the barcode in and the fancy ones to the fancy people. That's not where my mindset is and my thought process is. Um, there was a friend of mine that used geese. I think geese are very good at 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 identifying when somebody came in that they shouldn't be there, and and they're making a whole heap of noise. Right. So you you really have to think about your border. And you can also then use it as a um, um, a source of, of material and also as a windbreak, you know. So you're designing your farm okay. to be more resilient. Exactly. And um, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that those are, you know, some low hanging fruit that we definitely can embrace. Uh, we know that our people are very, very innovative. And so we have to always be one step ahead. And yeah. there's technology where they use the DNA of the particular animal and they can implant that in uh, a tracking device. So wherever that goes, then you can, you can track it. And yeah, yeah, you can you submit, have developing uh, uh, countries uh, uh, that are using yeah, this. Yeah, you can yes, submit yes. Your, 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 your sample of the DNA of the animal. But you don't right. want to do anything yeah. that's going to be too difficult or too costly. You know, if, if there's something you can yeah. do that is okay. Less another question. Okay, another question I have here. Um, 
And this is from Jeannie, and then come back to my question. Can we look at biotechnology as a solution for rural youth unemployment? Definitely, and this is one, this is the biggest reason I started this research group, is I wanted to um, put my time and effort into something that would help as many people for as long as possible. And the area that I think is the best one for the rural youth employment is in the value added. Um, essential oils, um, dried um, fruit, you know, where what you're doing is you're removing the water from the products up in the hills and you're taking out from the hills the, the, the concentrates of, of the plants. And, and that's a higher value and it, and it um, keeps longer. It, it hurt me many years ago when they were doing ginger in um, Portland. And when the ginger came and, and they came to buy the ginger, it, the price was so low, they said, no, 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 sell it to you and let it rot. Well, they could have dried it and made all your resin, you know? Mm -hmm. Or even Wait, dried it and sold um, it dry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and I mean, you, you have been doing some work with, with some, I noticed, young farmers, farmers that have children, the next generation, and, and infusing that interest. And I'm really pleased to see that there's several um, young farming groups, both women as well as um, unemployed youth and marginalized youth that are getting interested. And it reminds me of a project that um, we did at SRC some years back, engaging inner city youth in tissue culture. They were so excited to put on their lab coats and to come to the council and learn how to do tissue culture to be able to transfer to their community and provide plants that could be grown up like the pineapple and ginger. Right. And, so and there's definitely a way to, it, you know, it, yes. it should be, it, it's tissue culture, but it's also any type of propagation. We have a big project now mm -hmm. with bamboo in um, Peckham one of the poorest areas, and they, they're coming up into industrial level production of bamboo. I mean, that is a big yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, you will have to ask SRC that, uh, <laughs> but I do think that it should happen. <laughs> the SRC collaborate with the, the biotech in terms of foresighting. And, and, Esra, and Esrad, because uh, um, we don't want it to be all economic, but we have to look at the economics, you know, with the foresighting, because it, it has to make sense. It has to economically make and sense. And one thing well. that we have, sure, one thing that we have learned as small island developing states and as developing countries in general is that collaboration is, is um, the order yes. of the day. You have yes. collaboration with academia, you have collaboration with, with, with um, other government agencies as well as with businesses. And this is how we, we actually um, leapfrog ahead into, into the future that we want. Um, so I have a question here, Sylvia, and you touched on it a bit in your presentation, but I wanted you to elaborate. And that's the whole issue of seed banks. Um, mm -hmm. In many cultures in Latin America, and I think we used to have it too here uh, with our Tainos, there was a tradition of saving seeds and taking them to a market at that specific day of the month and exchanging seeds. Mm -hmm. And in the era where we have um, challenges in terms of climate change and, and the like, and we're looking for more resilient seeds, where the more flood resistant or drought resistant. Uh, do you see um, that kind of culture being reintegrated in our agricultural system based on the fact that you are now able to support the, the, the seed banks in terms of the, the biotechnology aspect in terms of um, giving them either a genetic barcode or something that they know that this one, this particular seed is good for this area or it's good for, for resisting this kind of pest 
naturally or, or, or for drought. Do you see that being integrated here in Jamaica? Yeah, I, I would like to see the researchers giving that kind of information that, that can be useful to the farmers when, when they have their seed. And what I've been doing actually is helping the farmers to, to take the data, how to set up a, a, a research um, experiment so that they could tell, is it really resistant? Is it really giving a higher yield? May, they may think it does, but when you do the analysis, it doesn't. So that is, that is the level of conversation you would have to have with the farmer in, in that level. Um, in terms of sharing seed, we are definitely going in that direction. And to be able to do that, we do need to up the, the capacity that we have the capability we have. But I think with, with this kind of foresighting and you being able to state where you want to go, you're able to do your SWOT analysis better. You're, you're able to do your gap analysis better to identify where your strengths are and your weaknesses and where what you have and what you need to get there. You know, and, and again, I, I've been doing this by myself. I am very happy to be part of SRAD because I am tired of talking to myself. And I, it has been a long time trying to find like minded people that are going in the same direction as, as I, I think we should be going <laughs> to, <laughs> to get there. Okay, we have another question <laughs> here, and we, we're so grateful that we still have our full. Um, sweet of persons online, thank you so much for staying with us. And um, we're coming close to the end, but we have a couple more questions. And this one is from an anonymous attendee. And the person says, the process of foresighting requires involvement of the entire value chain, from research through commercialization and marketing, as well as policymakers, facilitators, to identify commercially viable priorities. Do you have any suggestion of how to improve coordination among the players, among all the players to undertake foresight? Large commercial producers are potential sources of funding for research, etc. Yes. The, the, the suggestion I have is, is to do exactly what we're doing, to let the the scientists, and I will not call myself a pure scientist because I'm coming from geography, which is social science as well as, as science. Um, so the, 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 it comes to that last part there about the relationship. The social scientists have to talk to the medical, um, to, the, to the scientists, to the economics, so all the different groupings and, and the purpose of it is to foresight where, where it is we want agriculture biotechnology to go for our, and the best way to do that is not to let the group just, just get, just because you, you want numbers, you will get people. You'll, you have to let it grow as, as it is growing. So we have, with SRAD, uh, we have started um, looking for funding and we have started getting funding, we are, we are going to go into a, a, a project now where we're going to be going through this with young people, right? Looking at the food, looking at climate change. And that, that is what we have to do. We have to continue to seek now for funding that is for this purpose of foresighting for the future. And, and all of you, think about it and, and, and see where we can go. So it, it, it has to be a collaborative thing. Thanks. Definitely. And it, it, it seems that it's an area that the National Commission on Science and Technology may be relevant in that they could pull all the relevant players together and assist with this process. And so that is, that's an agency out of the Office of the Prime Minister that possibly could be engaged. Um, I'm not sure if Pat has any questions in the chat box, but I have another question here, Sylvia. You know, we couldn't go without speaking a little bit more about GMOs and modern <laughs> biotechnology. Now, over the last mm, 
decade or so, it has been shown that developing countries have really um, embraced modern biotechnology. And we, we spoke about the GMOs being one plant and more advances um, being taking place in terms of gene editing, et cetera. But in terms of looking at our local um, foods or local plants, uh, countries in Africa and in Latin America have been using the tools of biotechnology to improve the productivity for food security. Would you see this as a um, useful strategy long-term in terms of the whole foresighting? Do you see as a tool in the toolbox for food security? And bearing in mind that 20, 20 years ago when the Carter Hill, 21 years ago when the Carter Hill protocol was signed, there were probably four or five transgenic crops. Now we're looking at several types of yams, you're looking at um, several types of beans, etc. that African countries have to invest in research to, 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 to look towards commercialization for their own food security. What are your thoughts about embracing um, genetic engineering with that in mind? First of all, when did Jamaica sign the Katinga Protocol? It was just the other day. It took Jamaica a long it, period it was ratified. to ratify it was the Katinga Protocol. Huh? Yeah, I know, but Jamaica, when did Jamaica sign it? it Jamaica, was, Jamaica signed it um, many years ago, but we got the two like steps in and ratifying it. Yeah, the ratifying of it. It, it, it's just the other day. But we're looking now. Into, and now the Nagoya Protocol, the, they, they haven't ratified that. So we yeah. are way behind. And in terms of whether that, that makes sense, it won't be me because I am full with trying to get a hand on what biodiversity we have right now and, and trying to make sure it's not lost and that our, our forests are not lost. And, and, and get these plants and make sure they keep growing um, so that we don't lose them. If, if somebody else wants to take it on and they have the time, the energy, the space, the money, but what I don't want to do is for that effort to override the other efforts. In, in big countries where you have a whole heap of funds and they can spend, um, I think IITA has spent a lot of money on, on YAM a lot of money we don't have that kind of money here and if, if there's one two three people in a research institute we have a lot of things to do i don't know if we have that space and time i mean i've known i've known people even at UE that uh, their whole life has been in gmo and it's one plant they're dealing with we're not going to get where we want to go with that kind of speed you understand okay. me? And those are big institutes with big, big investments with people and, and machinery to get that work done. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, Patricia, do you have any questions on the, in the chat box apart from what we have on the QA? No. The only question that I had raised was the relationship between the SRC and the Biotech Center um, in collaborating right. for this issue of foresighting. I mean, you have had a very strong role in the Scientific Research Council, but you've also worked internationally. Um, so what my question would be perhaps to you to look at from your perspective now as a consultant looking at sustainable food systems and realizing that the university is so under-resourced and so understaffed, but we do have a collective, which is the Sustainable Rural and Agriculture Development Cluster at Salesas. Um, how can we collaborate better from your breadth of experience and depth of experience? What would you say to us in terms of building these collaborative networks to um, do the foresighted and what has been the history 
in the SRC from your recollection of reaching out um, to, to, to the biotech center to, to kind of galvanize the work? I mean, Sylvia is one person and she's going to burn out if you know she's not helped. And, <laughs> and well, I'm certainly um, not going passion, to take on more than I can, I can Her take. passion is, is very important. Burn out. <laughs> but there needs to be the institutional kind of networking as well to make it viable for the long term. That's right. So I like the question that you had about this SD Division 2030 and linking it to the National Committee on um, Science and Technology. I don't know who's chairing that, no. But um, certainly some of these institutions have been defunct in terms of their operational capacities for a very long time. So they're there on paper, but they're not really working. So um, I would like to hear from you. Um, I don't know if you don't mind me putting you on the spot like that, but really the question is- I'll oh, get you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to draw my friendship card. <laughs> Uh, and, and just ask you to speak and on, on some of those um, issues of dynamic collaboration and the history behind how we collaborate. Thank, thanks, Ben. And, and, and you're quite right. I mean, we're all on the source, resourced, on the resource. I mean, the SRC, and I'm saying we, I'm not there anymore, but the SRC is on the resource as well as the university. And, 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 the NCST, all the relevant agencies that we could probably call on. But as you mentioned, collectively, if we can have a common focus, and I think the, 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 the idea that Sylvia has uh, proposed in terms of foresighting is a powerful tool. It tends to be a very expensive tool too, by the way, but it's a powerful tool that can be used for us to identify that common future. And then we know work backwards in order to put things in place to get there. One of our one of the downfalls, and it really, it really is a pity um, for us here in Jamaica, is that we we we, we don't sustain our efforts. And so um, you asked about the relationship with SRC and the Biotech Institute. It has been on again, off again, depending on on, on, on what is um what is taking place during, during a particular period. But it, it, it really could play a stronger role through an organization such as the NCST that brings all the players together. Through the NCST, you have a case, you have a UI, you have a SRC, you have a NCU, you have all the players at the table. And through this sort of vehicle, then we could together work on a common um, strategy that, again, could feed into the, the vision um, 2030. Yeah, which is also at the table. So it, it really, and, and you know, may Professor Leder's soul rest in peace, but he is one of the champions that felt like he was hitting his head against the wall at NCST when we try to, to move the ball so much further. We can't, we can't just move it so much further and then stop because it's going to roll back down. It has to be sustained. And um, Sylvia, in the biotech center, you say you're churning out research graduate students from year to year. Over the yeah. last 20 years since the center has been established, there must be a cadre of, of persons yes, out there all in over the various place. fields that can be mobilized. So it really mm -hmm. takes um, leadership. And I, again, um, I think at the policy level, it's a good place to start to, to invite persons to come to the table to let us look at it for our future. And um, I, I, don't, I don't see the SRC, for example, having any objections to working together with any institution that, that can add value to what they're doing. And it, it's, you know, it goes, goes both ways. Oh, there are two ideas um, in, in, you're talking that, that came back to me. One is the role of thinkers. Like, I don't know if you remember Dr. David Lee, very good friend of mine. He used to look up ideas and spread it around to everybody. So we still need that. We want people that their only job is to look up 
what what is happening in in the world of science and ideas and and, and sending it around the other thing is um a lecture like this i think should be given to politicians you know and i don't think if, i don't know if srad can uh, can make that happen um i remember when so we will try and I I did. Especially, <laughs> especially, out especially, especially if we can get the policy brief out of you um sylvia yes yes i started oh, with well, one in 2002 <laughs> to the planning council of the national executive at the time yeah uh, and um I told them, listen, we can go this way, but it will be depending on if we get the funding. And um, funding is, 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 a, is a thing as well. You can't just go on what funding is out there. You, have, you really need to know where you want to go. And then you look to the funding. Like if you talk about persistent and consistent, you have to know where you're going. And then you, you put the, the project together and then you go look for the funding. You don't get funding somewhere, you go to other funding. I can remember with EFJ, the Environmental Foundation, Jamaica, I had to go to their planning meetings and put my case, the funding be available for this purpose and then apply for the funding. You know? <laughs> so, so there, there yeah, are but ways. With, with all due respect, yeah, with all due respect too, if we're gonna engage funding and the private sector, Let's not forget to engage in the private sector because they will fund things too, but they have to see where it's going to lead. Where it's going to either save them money or make some money. And um, there are lots of cases where we can make that. So, so we need to invite the private sector to the table too. And that's why I come back to NCST because NCST has around the table everyone that can deal with science and technology, the recipients, the private sector, academia, the public sector, the NGOs, they're at the table. And if we can start there, that is where we can together feed our thoughts and come up with a common pathway for the future based on science. Uh, it may not necessarily be straight biotech, it might be, you know, uh, a merge of, of, of several things in order to get to where we want. And we have been um, diverted over the last year and a half with, with, with COVID and the pandemic, but within that also lies opportunities to promote the case of biotechnology. So we need as scientists to sit down and see how we could tell our story in a way that persons will stand up and take notice. Excellent, excellent intervention. Wow, it's really been a feast. I mean, uh, amazing presentation um, by Dr. Sylvia Mitchell um, with such simplicity to be able to move from the grassroots level of communication to the most sophisticated level of scientific discourses and then take it right back down to policy, practice, policy, um directions that you have highlighted and underlined in your presentation i just really want to say um commendation um i'm energized i'm educated <laughs> i realize how little i know <laughs> and how much more we have to do i'm very happy for the collaboration that um exists between us um between the biotech center and the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute through the Sustainable Rural and Agricultural Research Cluster. I want to also say um, an incredibly um, big thank you to Dr. Audia Barnett, who stepped up to the plate when I reached out to her on WhatsApp to um, support this, this, this um, intervention. And um, I knew from the start that having two women, <laughs> Caribbean Black women, Afro-descendant women with depth of experience, with passion, with um, organizational capacities, with wisdom, um, and with just that, that desire to see a change um, within their lifetime and for their, the future generation to come. I knew that this was a good mix. Um, Dr. Audia Barnett, who has had her background experience in, in science and technology and in leadership within the SRC and within the ECA group, the international um, ECA, it just slipped me. Anyway, um, so it's been a really, really rich feast um, and we will, as Sylvia has mandated us, 
um, certainly activate our um, energy to, to, to try and reach out to the relevant parties. I know there is a stakeholder consultation taking place um, next week, um, Jamaica um, being organized through the FAO and some other organizations that we will be part we will be parties of, and we will continue to make the case there and try to um, connect the dots. And I also wish to um, thank the um, persons who have been present here today with us, the um, audience and your brilliant questions, your um, very practical questions as well, and your informative questions. Um, Audio, are you trying to highlight, trying to, <laughs> you're trying to interrupt? <laughs> no, I was trying to type something in the chat box, but go ahead. Sorry. To oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were trying to, to um, give me a, a heads up. Right. So I'm um, just really um, giving my deep and sincere thanks to everyone who made this possible um, from the speaker, the moderator, um, the audience and their questions, as well as uh, um, the, the, the staff who supported us, Dr. Mr. Richard Leach, um, the indefatigable <laughs> Mr. Richard Leach with his humble and um, very smart approach to doing things. Um, also the creative and dynamic Mr. Orin Spence, who is our marketing officer, who does the flyers, who does um, media communication for us and who facilitates um, the marketing of the events. Um, certainly without him, I wouldn't be able to do what I try to do, which is to help the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute reach a wider audience on issues related to rural development and to have these conversations during a time of extreme transformational um, potential as well as crisis that we um, connect the dots and that we reach out to uh, groups that are underserved and um, to ourselves. As Sylvia said, she's tired to talk to herself and just having a group that you can come to and have conversations with and plan and organize to get funding to do important projects. Um, I wanted to highlight before I close that the project that um, Sylvia mentioned is a project that is being funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council by, in the UK. And it's called the um, Recipes for Resilience, Engaging Caribbean Youth in Climate Action and Afro-Descendant Food Heritage through story mapping and song. And the principal investigator is from the University of Edinburgh, and her name is Dr. Marissa Wilson, who is on the steering team, the coordination team for the Sustainable Rural and Agricultural Development Group. So we're an international collective. And um, Dr. Marissa Wilson is another fighter for the cause um, from Edinburgh. And she's very creative in her engagement. Um, that 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 allows us to do things so we're also involved in a seed infrastructures project which we have um, tried three times so far to get funding for um, we haven't been successful so far um, but we're continue we're not going to give up until we we get the funding that is needed for that so um, we are trying our best as a small research cluster to try and do more and to connect the dots internationally as well as locally and regionally um, to make this happen. One of the things that was mentioned in this conversation as well was the issue in relationship to funding. And I just wanted to flag that the consultative group on international agriculture and research, which is probably the largest and leading, um, it's called, um, I always say cigar because of the, the, the acronyms when I see it, I think of the word cigar, mm -hmm. which is C-G-I-A-R. <laughs> and this cigar. is consultative group. Um, so, so they have 310 million US dollars allocated over the next four years on this project called Crops to End Hunger which is going to be consulting with um, national, national um, institutions to look at accelerating plant breeding um, technologies and, and, and practices, given the very catastrophic space in which we're living with climate change, COVID-19, and all these other um, issues that are 
um, besetting us. So I think perhaps we need to reach out to an organization like that as well um, and, and link up our arms to see if we can get some of that 310 million US to the University of the West Indies with, with, with the ideas that Sylvia has about making things bottom up and um, user friendly and low hanging fruit before we spend, you know, a hundred million on one thing that impacts exactly. on two people, <laughs> you know, exactly. where we spend one million well targeted and you you transform the life of a rural community. You you drop wow. the crime rate. You 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 don't have so much issues with predial larceny. You you mm -hmm. you make miracles by basically targeted, focused research and funded. So I think um, Sylvia has opened her eyes again to the importance of a mass based um, science, science that is targeting to needs. So tailoring um, mm -hmm. is a very appropriate analogy here that we see what we want and then we talk to our clients and we get their knowledge to merge with our knowledge to produce the best fit for small mm -hmm. iodine carbon spaces that are overwhelmed with their riches, both Amen. in terms of their biodiversity, in terms of their human capital, in terms of their cultural exactly. creativity. I mean, we're like a diamond that's just lying in the field waiting for somebody to pick I, up. I call it a, a, a check <laughs> on the wall. You and know, so pretty, um, and we've never we have a it. very energetic minister now, Minister Green. I like to applaud him whenever I'm in this space as chair who has said that science will drive agriculture. But we know there are various sciences, as Sylvia Mitchell has pointed out, and we need to um, democratize and decolonize science studies so that we don't have hegemonic narratives or basically the big man telling us what we need to do and how we right. need to do it and right. when it needs to be done. But mm -hmm. we have our own voices, our own understanding of our context, and we can speak back to Paul and do it in a respectful way to say that, you know, listen, we've suffered enough. <laughs> it's time for us to have more than three persons in the biotech center. <laughs> you understand me? Seriously. Oh, so, I mean, if we're serious about our Seriously. future, I we really don't want to have mass famine. And, 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 and I mean, we read the headlines every day about other countries facing um, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, mm -hmm. in Haiti, mm -hmm. in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow, okay, so we have our hands full and now we need to just get our feet um, planted on the ground and, and moving forward to do what we need to do, what yeah. we know we can do exactly. and what we, what we have the resources. Basically, we to have do. the human talent. We just need the appropriate organizational alignment and the money to be directed in a sensible, smart and tailored way. So Amen. thank you for that wonderful presentation. If you wish to contact us, we are, you can reach us through our email. Silver sent her email. And our email is UWI Salises. So U W I S A L I S E S. So the acronym for where I work, the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies. So U is Salises dot srad at gmail. Dot com. But if you had access to our, our, our flyers, and if you registered, then it would be on all our flyers how to reach us, right? Their WhatsApp, contact, Gmail, website, all the information is there. But if you want to reach out, post this meeting, you can, you can send an email to uesalises.esrad at gmail.com. So um, I want to conclude by saying that um, we have some events being planned um, coming up. Our speaker series will continue to advance critical and decolonial rethinking for a paradigm reset in order to realize secure rural futures in the context of multiple crises from COVID-19 to the intensification of the impacts of climate change on our rural communities and food systems. We support the SDG goals of zero hunger, good health and well-being, as well as decent work and economic growth. We anticipate hosting an event with the Faculty of Science and Technology, the Faculty of Food and Agriculture, and the US Embassy to speak to the role of science for environmentally sustainable agriculture in October in celebrating the 2021 World Food Day. 
And we also anticipate an event being planned with Rutgers University to reflect on the conference of the parties 26 UN Climate Change Conference that takes place in November. And finally, we wish to close the food so the um, Celice's um, Sustainable Food Systems series with a, a round table on food sovereignty to discuss some of the challenges and the issues and perspectives from different stakeholders, the farmers, and perhaps um, if I am if I'm successful, a representative from La Via Campesina and from Open Seeds to discuss these issues of food sovereignty as we move forward into 2022. So I just want to thank everyone, the audience, the participants, the moderator. Um, Audrey is very busy. She's rushing from this meeting to go to another meeting. And I know Sylvia now the teaching semester started again. So we're all so very busy, but we need to make the time to do what matters because right now our lives are hanging in the balance. And without this tailoring and this focused and persistent effort, we will not be able to leave a future for our children in which we can feel confident that they will be able to survive. So thank you all for your um, presence today. And um, that's it, I think. <laughs> La luta continua. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the okay, opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and I, I hope everyone um, got their answers, their questions addressed, and um, you can email us after. I think Sylvia put her email in the chat yes, box. Yes, yes, let's keep the conversation. Oh, I where I can help any the, any group, any the, the um, email for Celisus as well. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, so, oh, I misspelled Celisus. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. I was I was <laughs> rushing. <laughs> uh, you see, when you're trying to do, I know time is against us. So I don't want to hold people up too much. Is that right now? So you is Celisa's dot at gmail dot com. Yeah. Right. So, okay, everyone, have a have a um great afternoon and um um stay safe. Um, and stay yeah. focused. Don't give yeah. up the fight. We are all in it together. Thank you very much, Audia. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Richard, and all the ones who supported us to make this happen. Thank you, Pat. Thank Keep you. Up the excellent work. Bye. The best. Yes, Audia. And the recording.